to think about Shenzhen, to think about China, in a lot of sense, is the, the huge amount of technology just turned into commodity here. Not just mobile phone, we're going to EV, same thing. Things get turned into commodity in China. In 1980, Shenzhen looked like this, a small fishing village with 200,000 citizens. Today, it's a giant metropolis with over 23 million people and the world's capital of hardware. Over the last 40 years, Shenzhen became the number one innovation hub for new mobility. The city now has 21,000 electric taxis, over 16,000 electric buses and countless electric scooters. What's the story behind this mega city of the future? On the first day of our China trip, we visited the Shenzhen Open Innovation Lab to find out all about it. Shenzhen doesn't follow the, the traditional narrative of how an innovation hub looks like. People basically say, okay, well, it's a global sweatshop. It's just labor, cheap labor. There cannot be innovation there. It's a crazy global sweatshop where people are making iPhone and jumping off the roof. Shenzhen innovation is not driven by this uh, one iconic company. It's actually been driven by a huge, massive number of entrepreneurs who comes to Shenzhen and exploring opportunity. One thing to notice here is Apple, that's the big American company. Samsung, that's a Korean company. What about the rest? They are all Chinese company. And here's the other thing. With the exception of Xiaomi, the rest of the company are all from Shenzhen. They are all Shenzhen company. Everything gets started in 1980. In China, every policy gets announced and experiment. And only when the experiments are successful, they get propagated. So since I started experiment, foreign direct investment, new kind of managing corporation, private corporation. In the 80s, uh, this mass manufacturer, large outsourcing manufacturer comes in. And what's interesting for Shenzhen is the, a lot of electronics comes into Shenzhen in the AD outsourcing. The only meaningful market is North America and Europe. But really what really starting to inform the change of Shenzhen uh, comes in the late 90s. The reform is working, Chinese starting to have money, uh, disposable income. And when you have disposable income, one thing you do is entertainment. And the best entertainment in the late 90s is DVD. At that time, Shenzhen already have huge amount of the electronic productions, engineers, factories, everything. So decided, well, let's make a DVD which reads everything and cost $50. Everybody had fun. And it turns out this actually informed the, the psyche of the Shenzhen business because this is mostly goes to China, Southeast Asia, India, South America. So that's the rest of the world. And it turns out there are 6 billion people in the rest of the world. Why are we continue to obsess with the billion people at the top of that pyramid when there are 6 billion for our business? So this is really getting to the psyches of the, the cities. I'm not going to fight incumbent on the same market. I'm going to go to the market where the incumbent doesn't think of them as customer. Even Apple today, doesn't really think about the bottom of the pyramid as a market. And that's where all the disruption happened coming out of here. 2002, 2001, 2002, the other huge, huge opportunity came, mobile phone. As Shenzhen, we jump into starting to making a cheap GSM phone. In the beginning, it's easy. You basically just copy whatever is out there. It's not so much about piracy, it's more about, well, why would you go through the trouble to re-educate the market. Just make something similar. Early 2000 Shenzhen, intellectual property was not important. Everybody copy everybody. First, how can I make this cheaper, faster? 2005, 
Nokia phone still costs $400. You can easily get this kind of things in that market, somewhere between $40 to $70. If you own an Apple, you lose your charger, you have two options. $45 in the Apple store, or $5 on eBay. And the eBay one, you don't trust them. But if you sit in Shenzhen, you realize one thing is the $45, $5, they are coming from the same factories. Really easy money in Shenzhen. Now everybody can make a Nokia, it doesn't really be the competitive advantage. Because of the availability of things right there on the market, uh, people think about business in a very different way. You're starting to explore niche market where large companies are not doing. And you make it available today when you know there are going to be people lined up to buy this. In Shenzhen. Putting together a car is no more different than putting together a new phone. How the auto company works these days is the, the large company. They get their things from what's called the first tier supplier, which acts more or less like ODM. The large car company no longer design their own frame, a lot of the thing in the car. They come with whatever the suppliers can provide them. And so they are first tier, which supplies to Volkswagen, Shanghai Auto, but they are small company. They are still small company around, so they have, they have been served by second tier, third tier, fourth tier. And so today, with all that joint venture initiated by all the big China auto company, the entire ecosystem of first, second, third, fourth tier suppliers of every immeasurable auto part are emerged in China. For a very long time, even before the, the production of the EV, local Chinese companies are already making their own uh, car brand because there's no real intellectual property barrier. You have money, you have market, you're starting a small plant in your region, assemble the car, you provide local job, and then government subsidize you for the land because well, you are providing working opportunity and paying tax. So there are over 800 companies in China who can legally make street legal car. 800 brands, that means some of them are as big as Shanghai Auto, but some of them is city level company making 100,000 cars a year, mostly for their city and the surrounding area. Their suppliers, they are in tens of thousands. And for electric, it's getting more excited and interesting is the, now you don't have the complicated combustion engine. Take out transmission, take out combustion engine. You put a motor, you put a whole bunch of battery in it. Well, you have electric car. It's not nothing new. And that's the key. One thing for sure is making real customer value delivery is electric bus. You don't need to really go pitch to bus company. Right now the only problem is the they still have 10 years left on the bus they have today. Other than that, electric bus is no brainer. Just because electric bus is easy, you run same, exactly same mileage every day. And then you come back, you charge, you go out the next day. Electric bus is cost down. Other than the NEV in China, this is another type of EV in China. It's called the low-speed electric vehicle. In the past 10 years, they put 5 million of this car onto the street with zero government subsidies. Here's the interesting part is the all 5 million goes to two <coughs> provinces in China. The two provinces has a lot of this company, uh, golf car and tricycle. Electric car is basically golf car. So it's easy. Oh, you encasing the tricycle. Put a casing around the tricycle and then say, yeah, it's, a, it's an upgrade from your motorcycle. And this hits the right spot. This car cost $2,000. So it took off and this is cheap, it's easy. Uh, there's no license needed, there's no driver license needed. And they develop, so they're starting to have fun. Then you make this the big China EV strategy, they actually are officially prohibited for development in China. It's for the farmer, it's for the peasant. They don't like it, it's not cool. It's not Elon Musk cool. 
big huge change happened in this year. China has been very actively supporting electric vehicle for about a decade. Huge government subsidy, but it gets cut to half this year, and the subsidy will be gone in two years. I mean, the electric car company is so mature right now, it doesn't really matter what he says, so he's move on to promote his next favorite, hydrogen. Unlike other countries, you're still debating or oh, whether or not we go electric or hydrogen is the China goes electric, build the industry, and then the government just go on and say, okay, well, now you guys can go kill each other on the market. We are going hydrogen, we want hydrogen. Everywhere in the world, you talk about this as a competition. What Wang Gang did is the, he pushed this through, so EV become one of the choice for mobility development. Two years ago, we were sitting here and talking to executives from around the world, and they are like, ah, Huawei, ah, just another iPhone copy company. Uh, and now it's the, well, the most scary company on earth.